Have you ever wondered why there are countless unique personality types and why they continue to exist? It's intriguing how one person can have overwhelming anxiety while another can be incredibly bold and daring, even risking their own lives. The answer to this puzzle lies within the very question itself. If there was just one optimal personality type, natural selection would have favored it and we would all be very similar. However, reality paints a different picture. Instead, we're presented with a multitude of personality types, each with its own mix of advantages and drawbacks. In a 2006 research paper titled The Evolution of Personality Variation in Humans, Daniel Nettle tried to unravel the reasons behind why differences in personality might exist. And he thought it was the environmental influences that acted as pivotal drivers. You see, for behavioral tendencies to remain prevalent in a population, they must have served or continually serve some function that enhances an organism's ability to survive and reproduce, which is what we can call fitness. This means that these behaviors, whether it be being highly creative or highly neurotic, contributed to the survival and eventual reproductive success of individuals. So with this foundation, let's theorize how personality evolved and why it is important. When there is variation amongst the species of a specific trait, it means one of two things. Either the trait is neutral and therefore not highly selected for, which allows variation to persist, or the trait's advantage is based off the environment and as a result is constantly changing. Building on this idea, Kevin McDonald in 1995 put forth the theory that variation in personality traits represents alternative viable strategies for maximizing fitness. In other words, different personality traits such as high extroversion versus introversion could have served as adaptive strategies for our ancestors to survive and reproduce in our evolutionary history. The key to McDonald's idea lies in the concept of trade-offs. If two levels of a trait offer roughly equal advantages to the individual, increasing the trait might enhance some components of fitness while simultaneously decreasing others. Just like the idea of opportunity cost, where choosing one option means giving up another, every benefit gained by increasing a trait must come with a cost. If there are no trade-offs and increasing a trait only brings benefits, then natural selection would have favored that trait. Yet, in reality, traits tend to be balanced with both advantages and disadvantages. There is a lot of evidence showing that humans have significant biological variation, both at the physical and genetic levels. For example, the genes related to neurotransmitter systems like serotonin and dopamine vary greatly among individuals in the human population. These systems are crucially involved in health, stress, motivation, and social behavior. And the genetic differences are linked to variations in how people behave in these areas. Researchers studying genetics and behavior have identified strong genetic influences on important human qualities like personality, intelligence, and susceptibility to mental health conditions. Many of these traits are connected to reproductive success. For instance, both schizophrenia and personality traits can influence mating success, health, and life expectancy. So, heritable variation, which means genetic differences that can be passed from parents to offspring, are found in all natural populations. This variation is a fundamental outcome of evolution and was one of the key observations that led Charles Darwin to develop his theory of natural selection. When we measure traits like height or weight, we find that almost every feature in different species has some level of inherited influence, meaning even traits related to an individual's fitness which is their ability to survive and reproduce in their environment, show abundant genetic variation. In addition to physical traits, heritable diversity is also observed in the behaviors of individuals of many species. For example, in male crickets, there is a variation in how often the cricket will call, and this variation is influenced by genetic factors. So why does variation persist? It's because of how mutations and natural selection work together. Mutations bring new genetic differences, while selection gets rid of some of those differences. How much variety there is at a certain time depends on how these two processes balance out. When a single gene affects a trait, even weak selection can keep diversity low because mutations are rare. But for traits influenced by many genes, mutations happen more often and it takes time for selection to get rid of them. This is why traits influenced by multiple genes usually have a lot of genetic diversity. Quantitative traits, which are traits that vary along a continuum, think things like height or size, are rarely purely advantageous or disadvantageous. An increasing investment in one aspect of a trait often comes at the expense of other components of fitness. For example, growing larger may be beneficial in competition between members of the same sex, but it also raises metabolic costs with more food being needed to maintain a larger body size. In some species, different strategies exist within the same population due to genetic differences. For example, in the pygmy swordtail fish, 
There are large males that perform courtship displays and small males that sneak mating opportunities. Both strategies have their advantages and disadvantages, and the individuals may adopt different approaches based on their genetic makeup and environmental conditions. Overall, variation in traits and behaviors persists because it represents a range of strategies that individuals can employ to maximize their fitness. But the key is that the best trait for survival can change depending on the situation. This was seen in Galapagos finches. When times were dry and food was scarce, bigger birds with stronger beaks were better at cracking the hard seeds, so the population got bigger. But when the weather changed and soft seeds were better, smaller birds were favored. This up and down selection keeps a lot of genetic variety in the finch groups. In the Trinidadian guppy, there are heritable behavioral variations that affect survival in the presence of a predator. Guppies from different populations show different levels of boldness or alertness. Those living upstream of waterfalls without predators are bolder but less likely to survive when facing a pike, whereas those downstream have enhanced survival abilities against predators. When predators are introduced to predator-free streams, the population's behavior quickly adapts. Conversely, when predators are removed, alertness decreases and the population returns to a state similar to those with no history of predation. This indicates that anti-predator alertness comes with a cost, such as reduced time for foraging or mating. As a result, the population's distribution of behavior changes in response to the level of local predators. This interplay between different behaviors and their mixing can be even more complex, as exemplified in the great tit bird species. For birds, there is a behavioral dimension called exploration, where some individuals score high, being aggressive and bold in exploring, while others score low, exploring less freely and showing low aggression. This exploration behavior is consistent within individuals and has a substantial genetic component. In poor years, with limited food resources, there is a positive relationship between exploration score and the probability of survival for female birds. The bolder individuals are more successful at finding and competing for available resources. However, in years of abundance, when there is a lot of food, the relationship between female survival and exploration score becomes strongly negative. In the great tit bird species, the relationship between exploration behavior and survival also varies between males and females. The great tit experiments show that levels of exploration, which is like the personality dimension for creativity in humans, have both costs and benefit. Costs in terms of getting into aggressive encounters, with all the harm that can bring, and benefits in terms of holding resources or territories when these are limited. The right trade-off between advantages and disadvantages depends on the situation and whether an individual is male or female. Since these factors change, the entire group has a regular range of explorative behaviors, and it's based on genetic differences. In the examples I gave, the best behavior for highest fitness can change with conditions, and sometimes fitness can have multiple optimum points, not just one. This is called disruptive selection, and it refers to a process in nature where extreme traits are favored over the average traits. In the context of maintaining heritable variation in size and maturity, it means that animals with very large or very small sizes are more likely to survive and reproduce compared to those with medium sizes. This keeps the differences in size traits within a population from becoming too uniform. For example, in the coho salmon species, there are two types of males. Hook-nosed males, who compete with others to fertilize eggs, and jacks, who sneak in to fertilize eggs. Both types of males have similar fitness, while intermediate-sized males face a disadvantage, as they are not effective fighters and cannot hide well. Essentially, those in the middle size range struggle to reproduce, while the small and large ones do well. So disruptive selection will ensure that both small and large sizes continue to exist in the next population. In negative frequency dependent selection, a trait's advantage increases when it's rare in the population, but decreases when it becomes common. So less common traits have an advantage, leading to a cyclical pattern of favored traits over time. It's long been recognized that negative frequency dependency can help maintain diversity in a population. For example, in bluegill sunfish, there are two types of males, parental and cuckolding. When cuckolding males are rare, they have high reproductive success, but as they become more common, their success declines. This creates a balance between the two types, keeping both in the population. Looking at behavior in other species teaches us a few things about human personality. Firstly, Variation is common and comes from factors like changing pressures and many genes affecting behavior. Secondly, traits can have both pros and cons, with the best trait differing based on the situation. With this in mind, let's examine human personality variation. Extroversion is a personality trait related to positive emotions, curiosity, and seeking rewards. 
It is influenced by variations in brain circuits involving dopamine, a neurotransmitter related to pleasure. People high in extroversion tend to have more sexual partners, which can increase their fitness, especially in men. They are also more likely to engage in cheating or end a relationship for another one. The benefits of extroversion extend beyond mating, as extroverts are more socially active and have more social support compared to others. In addition to their positive traits, extroverts also show some risky behaviors. They are more physically active, curious, and sexually diverse. However, their adventurous nature can lead them to take risks that may result in accidents or illnesses, leading to hospitalization. High extroversion is also associated with a higher likelihood of migration, engaging in criminal or antisocial behavior, or being arrested. In the ancestral environment, these risky behaviors could have led to social isolation or even death. Extroversion can also be seen as a trait that brings benefits in terms of increased mating opportunities and exploration of new environments. However, it also carries costs, such as higher risks to personal survival due to accidents and illnesses, as well as potential negative impacts on offspring welfare. The turnover of relationships among extroverts may expose their offspring to step-parenting, which is known to be a risk factor for child well-being. Therefore, extroversion represents a trade-off between advantages in certain aspects of life and potential disadvantages in others. There is no one perfect point for this trade-off. Instead, the best choice keeps changing depending on the local conditions, like how many others are around and how they behave. The personality trait of neuroticism is linked to negative emotions like fear, sadness, anxiety, and guilt. It is well known in psychology for its negative effects. High neuroticism is a strong predictor of psychiatric disorders, particularly depression and anxiety. It is also associated with impaired physical health, likely due to chronic stress. Moreover, high neuroticism predicts relationship failure and social isolation. Overall, it appears to have a significantly negative impact on a person's well-being. So the real question is, are there any advantages to high neuroticism? Obviously, since neuroticism is normally distributed in the human population and people with high neuroticism continue to exist, there has to be advantages linked to it. Studies in animals like guppies suggest that being vigilant and cautious can be very advantageous in avoiding predators. But it also comes at a cost, because these traits are lost quickly when there's no threat of predation. In the past, having a certain level of neuroticism may have been necessary for avoiding immediate dangers in ancestral environments. Anxiety, which is related to neuroticism, can be seen as a trait that helps organisms detect threats around them quickly. It speeds up their reactions to potential dangers, causes them to interpret ambiguous stimuli as negative, and keeps their attention focused on potential threats. Certain groups who take extreme risks, such as Mount Everest climbers, have been found to be unusually low in neuroticism. Given the high death rates involved in such activities, around three people have died in attempting to climb Mount Everest, it's clear that neuroticism can be protective even if it's just because of inaction. But neuroticism may have other kinds of benefits as well. For instance, it is positively linked with competitiveness. Studies have shown that among university students, those who are resilient enough to handle the negative effects of neuroticism tend to achieve higher academic success, indicating a strong positive correlation between neuroticism and academic performance. These findings suggest the negative aspects of neuroticism can be redirected or channeled into a drive to improve one's position. In other words, individuals high in neuroticism may use their emotional intensity to push themselves to work harder and strive for better outcomes in various areas of life. Therefore, it is possible that having very low neuroticism could be disadvantageous in terms of lacking ambition or being too prone to take risks. On the other hand, although very high neuroticism has clear drawbacks, it might act as a driving force for achievement, particularly in competitive environments for those who can handle it. As a result, the best or optimal level of neuroticism would depend on specific local environmental conditions and individual characteristics. Either way, this variability leads to the trait coexisting in the population. The trait of openness to experience may appear entirely positive at first glance. It is linked to artistic creativity, and being artistic is thought to be attractive to potential mates. Studies suggest that women find creativity particularly attractive during the most fertile phase of the menstrual cycle. In poets and visual artists, tend to have higher numbers of sexual partners. Openness is considered a cognitive style that craves novelty and complexity while making connections between different domains. Although this cognitive style seems advantageous, it shares strong similarities with a certain aspect of psychosis. Yes, the personality trait of openness to experience is positively correlated with the unusual experiences scale for feelings and experiences. This scale measures tendencies associated with schizotypy, 
which includes unusual perceptual experiences or beliefs. The unusual experiences scale also shows a positive correlation with measures of creativity which is interesting because both individuals who score high on the unusual experiences scale and those who score high in openness are significantly more likely to have high levels of paranormal belief. In other words, they may be more likely to believe in things like psychic phenomena, ghosts, spirits, or other supernatural concepts. Along with this, the trait of unusual experiences is higher in schizophrenia patients, and very similar trait has been linked to the onset of schizophrenia in a long-term study. So openness is connected to both damaging psychotic and delusional experiences, as well as high cognitive functioning capabilities. Openness is also associated with depression. The unusual thinking style that comes with openness can lead to abstract ideas about the world, ranging from beliefs in supernatural or paranormal concepts to experiencing psychosis. However, what determines whether the outcome of openness is harmless or pathological is not fully understood. In other words, the reasons why some people with high openness can manage it well while others may experience harmful effects is still unclear. The impact of openness may depend on its degree or interactions with developmental events. For instance, poets and schizophrenia patients have similar unusual experiences scores, but poets don't have negative symptoms like social withdrawal which are present in schizophrenia patients. In non-clinical populations, the unusual experiences trait is positively linked to mating success, partly due to its association with creativity. However, when this trait leads to schizophrenia, reproductive success significantly decreases. This shows that the fitness benefits of openness vary depending on the context or conditions and leads to variability in how it affects individuals, which explains why there are diverse outcomes associated with this personality trait. The last of the two personality traits, conscientiousness and agreeableness have been extensively studied and tend to generate strong opinions. This is because they are generally linked to lower levels of delinquency and antisocial behavior. However, it is crucial not to confuse social desirability with positive effects on fitness. In nature, natural selection favors traits that increase reproductive success, even if it means outcompeting or taking advantage of others. Conscientiousness involves traits like orderliness and self-control in pursuing goals. One byproduct of conscientiousness is the ability to delay immediate gratification in favor of long-term plans. And through this, conscientiousness has various effects on health and behavior. For instance, it is positively associated with life expectancy as conscientious individuals tend to adopt healthier behaviors and avoid risky habits. However, very high levels of conscientious traits, such as moral principle or perfectionism and self-control, are found in patients with eating disorders and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Although people with obsessive traits might succeed in today's society, it's unclear if these same people would be successful if we were still living in the same conditions as our ancient ancestors. Highly conscientious individuals with their extreme self-control and rigid routines may face some drawbacks. Their excessive self-control can become pathological and harmful to their well-being. Moreover, their focus on long-term goals and delayed gratification may cause them to miss spontaneous opportunities that could enhance their reproductive success. Such individuals tend to have fewer short-term mating episodes and may overlook immediate advantages that could benefit them. Adaptations that encourage long-term planning and delayed gratification have the effect of reducing impulsive behaviors and opportunistic actions for immediate gains. While this can have fitness benefits in certain environments, it may also come with fitness costs particularly when immediate opportunities are present now, but may not be in the future. Agreeableness is a personality trait that reflects your level of empathy and trust towards others. Personality psychologists generally view it as beneficial, and its absence is associated with antisocial personality disorder. Some evolutionary psychologists propose that humans, as a highly social species, have evolved to be attuned to and understand the mental states of others. Our unique level of cooperation with unrelated individuals also suggests the importance of agreeableness in facilitating social interactions. Agreeable individuals tend to have harmonious relationships and avoid violence and interpersonal hostility. Their ability to foster positive interactions with others makes this trait highly advantageous. These types of people are often highly valued as friends and partners due to their cooperative nature. However, it is essential to recognize that unconditional trust in others is generally not a good adaptive strategy. If agreeableness leads to excessive attention to the needs and interests of others, or overly trusting behavior, it can be detrimental. In certain situations, being too agreeable and trusting can make an individual vulnerable to exploitation or manipulation by others, potentially impacting their reproductive success and overall well-being. Unconditionally trusting people are consistently outperformed 
by those who are more cautious or selective in trusting others. Low levels of agreeableness are also associated with higher levels of aggression. Among modern executives, agreeableness is linked to lower achieved status accumulation, and creative accomplishment is negatively associated with agreeableness as well. Though it is an uncomfortable truth to recognize, it is unlikely that fitness is unconditionally maximized by investing energy in positive attention to others. An empathetic cognitive style can be beneficial in some situations, but it may come with heavy costs, such as vulnerability to exploitation or neglecting your own personal gains. On the other hand, sociopaths who are low in agreeableness may sometimes achieve high fitness levels, especially when they are rare in a population. The advantages of being agreeable versus prioritizing personal interests will greatly depend on the specific environment or situation. For example, in a small, isolated group with a limited number of people to interact with, a need for common actions, high agreeableness may be selected for. Larger, looser social formations or situations in which the environment allows solitary foraging may select agreeableness downward. This of course brings up an interesting point, the reciprocal relationship between how personality traits act on the environment versus how the environment acts on and changes personality traits. And I'll make a video to explore this deeper in a later date. In conclusion, the evolution of personality traits is intricately tied to local environmental conditions. And what might be favored in one environment it can be completely deadly in another. And it is exactly for this reason that personality differences persist. So now that we've laid out the origins of personality trait, I want to take it to the next step. How does the personality trait someone have affect their consuming decisions? Why do they choose one product over another? Why does one brand speak to them and another one doesn't? That's something I want to explore in the next video in this series.